Um, I now have the privilege, um, as part of this nesting introduction, uh, to introduce Noviolet Bulawaya. Um, in her acknowledgments of her remarkable first no novel, Noviolet Bulawaya begins with the Zulu phrase, and forgive my terrible pronunciation, Umuntu, Nugumuntu, Nugabantu. A person is a person because of other people. I believe this belief runs through the heart of this book whose feisty, courageous protagonist, a girl named Darling, who combines innocence with the street savviness necessary to live in her impoverished village known as Paradise, and who refuses to give up hope and imagination both there and when she leaves her homeland of Zimbabwe to live with her aunt in Detroit, Michigan. Once you read We Need New Names, you will never forget the name No Violet Bulawayo, a name we will hear again and again. It is my pleasure to introduce a young woman who not only possesses the gift of storytelling, but an artist's soul, and even the trees and the stones know that No Violet not only loves the swag of her people, but of all humanity. Please welcome No Violet Bulawayo. I just want to start by thanking um, the parties responsible for my presence here um, the past couple of days. The English and Creative Writing Departments and the MFA students, especially um, Jennifer Hawk. Thank you to the Hemingway Festival and the Penn Hemingway Foundation. My journey with you has been such an incredible incredible honor, and one that also offends the generosity of, of American arts. Thank you for making it possible for me, coming from outside as I am, to feel included in this space. I very much appreciate it. I am going to read two short sections, and I brought my phone so I can time myself in case I lose track. My protagonist, Darling, um, has left her homeland for the U.S. and this one, one afternoon, she is hanging out um, with her aunt in, in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Her name is Darling and she's about uh, 11 in this section, I think. The aunt is trying to order a push-up around the phone. Uh, <laughs> Victoria's Secret. <laughs> I'm on my third Capri Sun now, and my stomach is so full of guava and liquid, it could burst. Aunt Costalina is busy trying to order her push-up bra on the phone, and you can hear that she and whoever she is speaking to are having issues. <laughs> The problem with English is this. You usually can't open your mouth and it comes out just like that. First, you have to think what you want to say. Then you have to find the words. Then you have to carefully arrange those words in your head. Then you have to say the words quietly to yourself to make sure you got them okay. And finally, the last step, which is to say the words out loud and have them sound just right. But then because you have to do all this, when you get to the final step, something strange has happened to you and you speak the way a drunk walks. <laughs> and because you are speaking like falling, it's as if you are an idiot, when the truth is that it's the language and the whole process that's messed up. 
I have decided the best way to deal with it all is to sound American, and the TV has told me just how to do it. It's pretty easy. All you have to do is watch Dora the Explorer, <laughs> Simpsons, SpongeBob, Scooby-Doo, and then you move on to that so Raven, Lee, Friends, Golden Girls, and so on, just listening and imitating the accents. If you do it well, then before you know it, nobody will ask you to repeat what you said. I also have my list of American words that I keep under the term like talismans ready to use. Pretty good, pain in the ass, for real, awesome, totally skinny, dude, freaking, bizarre, psyched, messed up, like tripping, douchebag, you're welcome, <laughs> acting up, yikes. <laughs> the TV has also told me that if I'm talking to someone, I have to look him in the eye, even if it is an adult, even if it's rude. I don't know why Aunt Mostalina doesn't think to learn American speech like this, seeing how it would make her life easier so she wouldn't have a hard time like she is right now. I said the Angel Collection. And Costalina is saying on the phone. She has muted the TV and raised the volume on the handset so I can hear the other person as well. She sounds like a bored young girl. I'm sorry, what? I mean, I didn't quite hear that. Maybe it's my line. I can picture her head cold, the young girl, a frown of concentration on her face. Angel, 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 and Costalina says, raising her voice even louder. There is silence, like maybe the girl is getting ready to pray. Angel, and Postalina adds helpfully, dragging out the words like she's breaking gravel. I silently mouth, Angel, Angel. I hear the girl make a small sigh. I'm sorry, I don't know what you mean, ma'am, she says finally. You can tell from her voice that she's getting tired from trying to understand. What do you mean you don't know what I mean? You don't understand what I'm saying? Such a simple word, and Postalina says. She is speaking with her hands and head now, and I can tell from her knotted face that if the girl doesn't get it soon, it's not going to be good. I clear my throat to remind and Postalina that I'm in the room, so maybe she will ask me to speak for her but she doesn't. Now she has scribbled the word angel all over the magazine, and the naked woman with the bride underwear is all clothed in black ink, the letters like tiny angry insects. Ma'am, I'm terribly sorry we are having these difficulties, but we have a website that you can order from. The girl on the phone starts, her voice lifting. You can tell that she is pleased with the fact that she has thought of the website, that things are going to work out after all. I am relieved as well, and I start thinking, maybe I should run upstairs and grab my MacBook for Aunt Costalina to use. I get up from the couch. No, I am not ordering online, Aunt Costalina says firmly, separating her words now, which is never a good sign. I sit back down. She pokes the Victoria's Secret woman's face with a pen as she says each word. I am not ordering online. I am speaking in English. So as far as I'm concerned, well, maybe you can spell it. The girl sounds like she's getting annoyed. Like maybe she's saying some serious insults inside her head that she can't say out loud. <laughs> now you want me to spell it, and Costalina says. She looks at me like she can't believe what she is hearing, but I look away at the TV. The woman is gone. There's a new one sitting on an exercise ball. I'm waiting for Aunt Costalina to tell the girl on the phone off, because that's what she sounds like she's getting ready to do. But something changes her mind, and she sits up and starts to spell. It's A, Aunt Costalina says. Her voice is a bit calmer. She has written the letter on the magazine, as if to be sure. Okay, A is an apple. No, not apple. A is an anus. It's 
a different sound. M as in known, G as in God, E as in it, L as in Libya, there you go, Angel, Angel, and Costadina says. There is a brief silence, like maybe the girl is considering what she has written, and then she says, Oh, you mean Angel? Yes, Angel. That's what I was trying to tell you all this time. I want a red one, and Mustadina says, rolling her arm, the sound of it like something is vibrating inside her mouth, and I promise myself I'll never ever sound like that. When Aunt Costadina gets off the phone with the Victoria's Secret lady, she dials a number that must be busy because she quickly hangs up. She immediately dials another and she has to hold for a little while before I hear her read a message in our language for the other person to call her back. I know the reason Aunt Costadina is calling is that she needs to tell the Victoria's Secret story to someone in our language, because this is what you must do in America whenever something like this happens. You have to tell it to someone who knows what you mean, who will understand exactly what you say, and that it is not your fault but the other person's. Someone who knows that English is like a huge iron door and you are always losing the keys. After leaving her message, Aunt Costalina just sits there as if something important is happening inside her and she is waiting for it to come out, kneel in front of her and announce that it's finished and can it please go attend to other business. She also has this look. I have seen it many times before, but I still don't know whether to call it pain or anger or sadness or whether it has a name. I am careful not to meet her eyes as she puts her card back in her purse and then gets up, walks downstairs to the basement and slams the door shut behind her. I know that she will turn on the lights as she descends the creaking stairway, that she will take small measured steps like there is something down there that she dreads, that when she gets to the bottom, she will stand in front of the mirror that covers one wall and look at her reflection. I know that she won't be looking at her thinness, but at her mouth. I know that she will stand there and start the conversation all over and say out loud, in careful English, all the things that she meant to say, that she should have said to the girl on the phone, but did not because she could not find the words at the time. I know that in front of that mirror, and Postalina will be articulate. That English will come alive on her tongue, and she will spit it like it's burning her mouth, like it's poison, like it's the only language she has ever known. So we need new names is um, told in the perspective of, of, of this young girl. But I have about three sections that kind of come in to interrupt her voice. And they are in the collective voice because um, I feel like our stories are incomplete without the we voice, no matter who we are. I feel like we have these voices propping us up. So this is the, the, the larger immigrant voice that's um, serving as the background to Darling's specific voice. It's called, the section is called How They Live. And when they asked us where we were from, we exchanged glances and smiled with the shyness of child brides. They said, Africa? We nodded yes. What part of Africa? We smiled. Is it that part where vultures wait for famished children to die? We smiled. Where the life expectancy is 35 years? We smiled. Is it there where dissidents shove AK-47s between women's legs? We smiled. Where people run about naked? We smiled. That part where they massacred each other? We smiled. 
Is it where the old president rigged the election and people were tortured and killed and a whole bunch of them put in prison and all? There, where they are dying of cholera. Oh my God, yes, we've seen your country. It's been on the news. And when these words tumbled from their lips like crushed bricks, we exchanged glances again and the water in our eyes broke. Our smiles melted like dying shadows and we wept, wept for our blessed, wretched country. We wept and wept and they pitied us and said, it's okay, it's okay, you are in America now. And still we wept and wept and wept and they gave us soft little things and said, here is some Kleenex, here. And we took the soft things and put them in our pockets to look at later. And we wept still, wept like widows, wept like orphans. In America, we saw more food than we had seen in all our lives, and we were so happy, we rummaged through the dustbins of our souls to retrieve the stained, broken pieces of God. We had flung him in the way back when we were still in our own country, flung him during desperate, desperate moments when we were dizzy with hunger, and we thought, how come he will not pity us? How come? Thought, why does he not hear us? Why? Thought, how come we ask and ask and ask and still are not even given a morsel? How come? And blind with rage, we flung him away and said, better no God, better no God than live like this, praying like this for things that will never come. Better no God. But then when we got to America and saw all that food, we held our breath and thought, Wait, there must be a God. So happy and grateful, we found his discarded pieces and put them together with crazy glue, bought at the dollar store for 99 cents and said, in God we trust too now, in God we trust for real, and began praying again. At McDonald's we devoured Big Macs and moved down fries and guzzled supersized cokes. At Burger King we worshipped wafers. At KFC, we mowed bucket chicken. We went to Chinese buffets and ate all we could inhale. Fried rice, chicken, beef, shrimp, and as for the things whose names we could not read, we simply pointed at and said, we want that. We ate like pigs, like wolves, like dignitaries. We ate like vultures, like stray dogs, like monsters. We ate like kings. We ate for all our past hunger, for our parents and brothers and sisters and relatives and friends who were still back there. We uttered their names between mouthfuls, conjured up their hungry faces and chapped lips, eating for those who could not be with us to eat for themselves. And when we were full, we carried our dense bodies with the dignity of elephants. If only our country could see us in America, see us each like kings in a land that was not ours. How America surprised us at first. If you were not happy with your body, you could go to a doctor, for instance, and say, Doctor, I was born in the wrong body. Just make me right. Doctor, I don't like this nose, these breasts, these lips. We looked at people sending their aging parents away to be taken care of by strangers. We looked at parents not being allowed to beat their own children. We looked at strange things like this, things we had never seen in our lives and said, what kind of land is this? Just what kind of land? Because we were not in our country, we could not use our own languages. And so when we spoke, our voices came out bruised. When we talked, our tongues thrashed madly in our mouths staggered like drunken men. Because we were not using our languages, we said things we did not mean. What we really wanted to say remained folded inside, trapped. In America, we did not always have the words. It was only when we were by ourselves that we spoke in our real voices. When we were alone, we summoned the horses of our languages and mounted their backs and galloped past skyscrapers. 
Always we were reluctant to come back down. How hard it was to get to America, harder than crawling through the anus of a needle. For the visas and passports we begged, despaired, lied, groveled, promised, charmed, bribed, anything to get us out of the country. For his passport and travel, Charazulu sold all of his father's cows against the old man's wishes. Perseverance had to take his sister Netsai out of school. No worked the fields of Botswana for nine months. No Zippo, like Primrose and Sipelogu in my day, slept with that fat black pig, Vanille Kosa, from the passport office. Girls flat on their backs, Vanille between their legs, America on their minds. To send us off properly, our elders built tobacco on the dry earth to summon the spirits of the ancestors for our protection. Unlike in years long gone, the spirits did not come dancing from the land beneath. They crawled, they stoled, they were hungry. They wanted blood and meat and needed beer. They wanted sacrifices, they wanted gifts. And save for a few grains of tobacco, we had nothing to give, absolutely nothing. And so the spirits just gazed at us with eyes milked dry of care. Between themselves they whispered, how will these ones ever be gone in that Meliga, as far away from the graves of their ancestors as it is? Do people not live in fear in Meliga, fear of evil? Do they not say it is like a grave in that Meliga, that going there is like burying yourself because your people will never see you again? Is not Meliga also that wretched place where they took looted black sons and daughters those many, many years ago. We heard all this, but we let it enter in one ear and leave through the other, pretended we did not hear. We would not be moved, we would not listen. We were going to America. In the footsteps of those looted black sons and daughters, we were going, yes, we were going. And when we got to America, we took our dreams looked at them tenderly as if they were newly born children and then put them away. We would not be pursuing them. We would never be the things we had wanted to be. Doctors, lawyers, teachers, engineers. No school for us, even though our visas were school visas. We knew we did not have the money for school to begin with, but we had applied for school visas because that was the only way out. Instead of going to school, we worked. Our social security card said, valid for work only with INS authorization, but we gritted our teeth and broke the law and worked. What else could we do? What could we have done? What could anybody have done? And because we were breaking the law, we dropped our heads in shame. We had never broken any laws before. We dropped our heads because we were no longer people. We were now illegals. When they debated what to do with illegals, we stopped breathing, stopped laughing, stopped everything, and listened. We heard exporting America, broken borders, war on the middle class, invasion, deportation, illegals, illegals, illegals. We beat our tongues till we tasted blood sat tensely on one butt cheek, afraid to sit on both because how can you sit properly when you don't know about your tomorrow? And because we were illegal and afraid to be discovered, we mostly kept to ourselves, stuck to our kind and shied away from those who were not like us. We did not know what they would think of us, what they would do about us. We did not want their wrath, we did not want their curiosity. We did not want any attention. We did not meet stairs and we avoided gazes. We hid our real names, gave false ones when asked. We built mountains between us and them. We dug rivers, we planted thorns. We had paid so much to be in America and we did not want to lose it all. When they talked about employers checking on workers, our hearts sank. We recalled the tatters of our country left behind, barely held together by American do dollars, by monies from other countries, and our blood went cold. And when at work they asked for our papers, 
with courage like startled hens and flocks to unwanted jobs where we met the many others. Others with names like myths, names like puzzles, names we had never heard before. Nirhilio, Fahim, Aziz, Bako, Taihun, Usman, Kimatsu. When it was hard to say the many strange names, we called them by their countries. So, how on earth do you do this, Sri Lanka? Mexico, are you coming or what? Is it really true you sold a kidney to come to America, India? Guys, Chagazu, give Chagazuri a break. The guy is old, I'm just saying. We know you despise this job, Sudan, but deal with it. Come on, Ethiopia, move, move, move. Israel, Kazakhstan, Niger, brothers, let's go. The others spoke languages we did not know, worshipped different gods, ate what we would not dare touch. But like us, they had left their homelands behind. They flipped open their wallets to show us faded photographs of mothers whose faces bore the same creases of worry as our very own mothers. Siblings bleak eyed with dreams unfulfilled like those of our own. Fathers forlorn and defeated like ours. We had never seen their countries, but we knew about everything in those pictures. We were not altogether strangers. And the jobs we worked. Jesus, 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 the jobs we worked. Low, break, low paying jobs, back breaking jobs, jobs that ate the bones of our dignity, devoured the meat, turned the marrow. We took hot irons and ironed our pride blood. We cleaned toilets, we picked tobacco and fruit under the boiling sun until we hung our tongues and painted like dogs. We butchered animals, slit throats, drained blood. We worked with dangerous machines, holding our breath like crocodiles underwater, our minds on the money and never on our lives. Adam got murdered by, by that beast of a machine that also ate three fingers of Sudan's left hands. We cut ourselves working on meat, we got skin diseases. We inhaled bad smells until our lungs thundered. Ecuador fell from 40 stories working on a roof and shattered his spine, screaming, Miss Ehos, Miss Ehos, on his way down. We got sick but did not go to hospitals, could not go to hospitals. We swallowed every pain like a bitter pill, drank every fear like a love potion, and we wept and wept. Every two weeks we got our paychecks and sent money home by Western Union and MoneyGram. We bought food and clothes for the families left behind. We paid school fees for the little ones. We got text messages that said hunger, that said help, that said unzima, and we sent money. When we were asked, you guys work so hard, why do you all work so hard? We smiled. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm happy to take questions. When I was thanking people, I forgot to thank the many wonderful folks I've been hanging out with over the past couple of days. I came here without a coat. Um, that speaks to how organized I am. But uh, Georgia was generous enough to lend me a, a coat. So I'm very, very grateful for the kindness. Um, I'll take a few questions, if there are questions. Yes. So I guess I finished the book maybe two or three weeks ago. And I've, I've thought a lot about many parts. So the one where Darling, I think, is talking about Americans and you know the obesity and the fake smiles. And mm -hmm. I thought it was, a, it was a perfect skewering of Americans. But I wonder how it's kind of great for you not being an American to have a character say that was, um, was so insightful that also you could say mean or, you know, how, how did you feel writing something like that? How did I feel writing something like that? <laughs> Mean. I've had readers saying, Ben, darling, can this darling kid can be mean. 
Uh, and I'm like, yeah, she's a, she's a fictional character. As long as, <laughs> as long as we get it, that it's not, she's not a representation. But I, I, I feel like um, she's saying a truth as she sees it, you know. And my obligation as a creator is to honor her and her perspectives as best as I can. And I feel like sometimes, you know, things have to be said, no matter how difficult and, and problematic that is. And if you, you know, and, and if, you, if you think about her, you realize that she has the same attitude toward her homeland. You know, she's always looking at the world and critiquing it. And she does not spare either Zimbabwe or the US, she just looks at them uh, pretty much the same. And when I'm creating, I really try not to worry that much about the reader, otherwise I would end up writing the text that the reader might want to hear, but not the text that I want to, to write myself. I think that's why it's so powerful. And, and thank you for reading. <laughs> it's awkward standing here. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Uh, I just wondered if you would take a minute and tell your own story about your journey in writing. Um, well, okay. Interested in it and okay. I'm glad you said in writing because that's specific. I don't have to, to air my business. Um, <laughs> but thank you for that for that question. I um, growing up, I, I really didn't have an interest in writing or becoming a writer. Um, storytelling was a, it, it took a, a, a different form. I was, I was raised by storytellers who told us stories. That was mostly my grandmother and my father who told stories consistently throughout my childhood. So I, I thought of storytelling as the stories that you hear, not necessarily stories that you write. And I was not, never really surrounded by books until I came to the US to study. I was supposed to study law, but I feel like that was mostly my father's dream. Um, and understandably so, because my, my generation was born right after the end of British colonial rule. And we were the first generation of, of, you know, born in a free country. So our parents wanted us to pursue these real professions, engineering, law, etc. And I was in that boat until I came here. I had an aunt in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and uh, she was she was not exactly Zimbabwean because she'd, been, she'd lived here for decades. So I found myself without serious adult supervision. Uh, which allowed me to just get into things and pursue my, my passion. And I took my very first creative writing class at this community college in Michigan, and I found myself taking a class every semester after that until I decided, instead of applying to law school, years later I applied for an MFA um, and studied and took, for the first time, took my writing quite quite seriously. And being in that environment of generous teachers and students who were committed to writing and reading, I think was a, a turning point in my in my journey. And that's where I wrote We Need New Names. I was fortunately or unfortunately I wrote it at a time when my country started unraveling, so I had a lot of material. Um, Whatever I, I was doing became a conversation with what was happening back home. And I, I started in 2008 and I finished in 2012. I finished writing the book in 2012. Yes? You have a beautiful name. And I was wondering if you could give us a little history or background on um, No Violence. Uh, it's, it's not my given name. My, my given name was Elizabeth. Uh, I was named after my grandmother, who was in ten, named after the Queen. Um, I, I, I really did not have that much of an attachment to the name. But anyway, no Violet is my mother's name. Violet is my mother's name. My mother died when I was 18 months, and um, she was never spoken about. 
So I felt like that was a, a silencing that not only was unfair, but also messed us up, you know, her younger kids were not who didn't have any memory um, of her. So I decided that if I, when I grew up, I would honor her memory by using her name. And I did. The N-O in my language means with. So I felt like I was raising her from the dead in my own way. And then Hulawai, of course, is my hometown. I was in the U.S. for, for 13 years before I was able to go back to Zim to visit. So it, I, I felt it. it made me connect to the homeland even though I was not there. Beautiful. Thank you. Yes. If you give one piece of advice to the assignment young writers from the assignment you'll be like, what would it be? I feel unqualified. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I, I will say, um, take yourself and your work seriously. And, and, and put in the hours, either by reading a lot or figuring who you are, because I believe that's part of your journey, figuring why you are writing, the, the kind of themes that you're interested in, um, your strengths and your weaknesses, and, and working consistently to, to take yourself to the, to the next level.